everybody. Hello, everybody. Good to see you. Um, let me see if something's happening here on my screen. Okay. I just started the recording. Okay. Okay, wait a second here. I'm having a little Zoom moment for there. Um, my name is Linda Ashley. I'm chairman of the Huntington Woods Peace Group, which as you know, uh, was founded in Huntington Woods, but we're open to everybody all across Southeast Michigan. And we thank you for joining us today. It's gonna to be a wonderful presentation. Um, Mary Murphy is a co-chair of the group and I think she's gonna be online soon. She might be a little late, but I wanna thank her, thank her for all her support. And Shirley Chalmers, who has really been instrumental in putting this program together. Shirley, hello. Hi. <laughs> and uh, Melanie Goldberg, who is what I call our technical guru, <laughs> who keeps us all going. So when you have questions, uh, in the second part of the program after the presentation, just put them in the chat room and Melanie will make sure they all get answered. Um, and um, I just want to take an opportunity to, um, I don't think Steve is on the line right now. Steve, if you're there, tell me, but I haven't seen him yet. He usually makes a little uh, introduction regarding indigenous people. We want to say something about how we appreciate the indigenous people that were here before us and uh, take a moment to recognize them before we begin our meeting. Um, he does it a little more eloquently than I do, but that's the spirit of the thing. <laughs> um, and just to tell you about our group, there are some newcomers here. We were founded about 20 years ago at the start of the Iraq war. war. Wow. And ever since then, uh, we've been dedicated to the cause of peace and justice with demonstrations, actions, and speakers, and joining with other groups, uh, including Citizens for Peace, um, that are dedicated to those causes. And we've been advancing them that way as well. Um, we've had so many wonderful speakers over these years. For example, recently, Daniel Ellsberg spoke to us from the P Pentagon Papers fame. Uh, Lucino Hamilton was a fascinating um, gentleman who was actually wrongfully incarcerated for 20 years. Uh, Rich Peacock, who's on our board, um, and he's with us today. And he uh, is, of course, co-chair of Peace Action of Michigan. He talked to us about peace initiatives in the Biden administration. And um, last month, we were very pleased to join with Citizens for Peace uh, to hear Middle East expert and activist Saeed Khan. Um, we've had numerous speakers on the racial justice movement. Um, and as a result of that, um, as many of you know, uh, we've been meeting uh, on the corner of Eleven and Woodward, uh, uh, where we uh, support the cause of uh, Black Lives Matter and uh, racial justice movement. And it's really been a terrific experience. We've been doing it all that time since George Floyd was killed. Ever since then, every Monday at 5.30, there we are. We have our signs. And what's happened is that the traffic down Woodward is so supportive. They honk their horns like crazy. It turns out to be a really um, inspiring experience. So I invite all of you to just come out there to the corner at 5.30. I think we're gonna change it to five when the uh, weather gets a little, uh, when the time change happens, but keep track of that and take a moment to come uh, do that with us because I think you'll find it a real inspirational experience. And uh, that brings us to tonight. We are very privileged to have a wonderful speaker tonight, David Swanson. He's joining us from Virginia. So that's one of the good things about this COVID thing we've been going to. We, we've had Zoom speakers from all over the country. Um, David is an author, activist, journalist, and radio host. He is co-founder and executive director of World Beyond War and he's campaign coordinator for Roots Action. Uh, his books include War is a Lie, and he blogs under davidswanson.org and warisacrime.org. He ho hosts Talk Nation Radio. He's also a Nobel Peace Prize nominee and was awarded the 2018 
Peace Prize by the U.S. Peace Memorial Foundation. And tonight he has a provocative subject in mind for us, which is entitled Militaries Left Out of Climate Agreements and What Else We Don't Know That Will Hurt Us. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to David. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for including me. Um, I, I will share screen and, and show a PowerPoint, uh, uh, but, and then I guess we'll do questions and answers and discussion after that, but feel free to jump in if there's a question that needs to be asked. Um, see if I can get this thing to work. So if you see that title screen, military is left out of climate agreements and what else? We don't know that will hurt us. I am obviously not going to cover everything we don't know and pretty much nothing that I don't know, but uh, a few things uh, that most people don't know. Um, omissions, we don't like to talk about that. So is, this is not just a problem of militaries and climate agreements. Militaries, while you know, being ever more present and thank you for your service and special parking places and get on the airplane first and all of this ever more in our face, still militaries and military spending and wars are not present, are conspicuously absent from numerous places where they ought to be. Uh, so we see analyses of how pandemics spread that completely leave out uh, the role of militaries and military bases that are given waivers on the, on the restrictions that are applied to everyone else. Uh, we see discussions of governmental budgets, uh, of what is spent on what. The, the two biggest bills in the history of the universe, the, the reconciliation build back better and the infrastructure extravaganza. And of course, no one mentions that put them together and their annual spending is dramatically less than the annual spending on just the Pentagon's bit of the military spending. Um, and and shrinking from there, apparently. Um, uh, big movies in the theaters about the forever chemicals, the PFAS uh, chemicals that never go away and, and cause cancer and so forth. And the biggest source of them is of course, militaries, uh, but that's left out. Uh, the, the United States Congress, the government that is essentially a war machine with a little bit of domestic, uh, you know, paint on top. Uh, most Congress members run for office without ever mentioning the military spending, the military wars, peace, treaties, international law, the existence of 96% of humanity at all. Uh, the Green New Deal, of course, there's no no taking any money out of militarism, no taking any militarism out of the budget. Uh, the, uh, the most of the coalitions that you see formed for many, many years around every progressive issue, some of them literally called every progressive issue under the sun, but no peace, no anti-war. Uh, the reconciliation bill, of course, uh, already mentioned, but uh, if you actually read the thing, it starts out uh, with all the increased military spending that uh, that's desired in this great progressive uh, piece of legislation for the next 10 years, somehow knowing that it simply must go up in that 10th year, despite whatever it's supposedly accomplishing in the first nine, right? Uh, and then climate agreements, too. Uh, these agreements by which governments uh, around the world purport to address their destruction of the climate simply leave out, simply give a waiver to one of the major ways in which uh, many of them destroy the climate. Um, so if you go to COP26.info, you'll see a petition that World Beyond War has set up with getting close to 500 other organizations signed on and around 25,000 uh, individuals signed on asking this 26th uh, UN climate meeting that's going to happen uh, very soon in Glasgow, uh, Scotland, to stop leaving militaries out uh, of climate agreements. Um, and so, you know, our, our 
purpose with the petition, with the, the, the virtual events we're doing around it and the real world events that we have planned for Glasgow. We have uh, events planned there on November 4th, November 6th, et cetera. And November 6th is a day uh, for events on this topic around the world, not just in Scotland. The, the purpose is first and foremost to make people aware that militaries uh, contribute significantly to climate destruction, make people aware that they are left out of the climate agreements and advance the demand uh, to change that. Um, let me get the next slide. But I want to I want to put this in a little bit of, of context because the greenhouse gas emissions is just one bit of how militarism uh, impacts the environment. Um, and if you if you look at I mean, I've got a number of, of ways listed on on the slide, but if, if you look at the budget of a government, of course, especially the US government, uh, the money that could be used to mitigate the destruction of the climate and ecosystems uh, is easily found in a tiny fraction of the trillions of dollars going into militarism. Uh, and the militarism and the hostility and the, the demands out of Congress members for threats to China and, and just every step towards war with China uh, it prevents the cooperation between governments that is so badly needed uh, in order to deal with real problems uh, that we have a choice that we have no choice about dealing with, uh, including environmental ones. Um, and then, of course, militarism is itself a huge cause of environmental destruction. The, the majority of the environmental disaster Superfund sites around the United States are military bases, former military installations. Um, the, the, the poisoning of the air and the water and the, and the soil by the U.S. military uh, at these and many other locations uh, is incredible. Uh, the, the military is the third biggest polluter of, of US waterways. Uh, carcinogenic chemicals, radioactive chem rocket fuel, toxic sewage, uh, and the most deadly weapons left behind by wars, which uh, of course devastate the places where they are fought. I'm, I'm talking about the devastation of the place where people supposedly matter and for on whose behalf all the war distant overseas wars are fought but the places where they actually fought are just destroyed uh, and leave behind such treasures as landmines and cluster bombs uh the u.s state department not long ago said perhaps the most toxic and widespread pollution facing mankind is landmines. You have millions of hectares uh, in Europe, in North Africa, in Asia that are just just can't be used anymore, uh, ruined by landmines. Uh, but looking in particular at the greenhouse gas emissions uh, of the military, uh, in, in the years 2001 to 2019, you're looking at 1.2 billion metric tons of greenhouse gases, about what you get out of every car in the United States in a year. Uh, the Department of So-Called Defense is the single largest consumer of, of oil, $17 billion a year, at least anywhere on Earth. Uh, and is the largest landholder anywhere on earth, uh, which includes some 800 military bases in other people's countries. Um, and the U.S. consumption of oil, the U.S. military's consumption of oil is more than the entire consumption of oil by many countries, uh, and not just their militaries. Um, Three quarters uh, of US military's petroleum consumption is for airplanes and helicopters. Over half is for the Air Force. Uh, a B-52 bomber airplane flying for one hour emits as much uh, as an average car driver driving around for seven years. Uh, and about 30 to 40% of the military's greenhouse gas emissions 
are from their bases, uh, which include several hundred bases in other people's countries. And so there will arise the issue, if we ever get this on the table at all, uh, of the US military trying to uh, you know, credit the, that pollution to the countries where it's doing it, rather than to the United States. Um, if you go to worldbeyondwar.org uh, and you click on resources at the top or you type in slash resources, we just last week uh, created this system where you can pick a topic, pick a type of resource such as an article, a report, a video, a, a, a webinar, a, a graphic, a, a whatever, uh, and pick what languages you want and get the results. And so if you if you go under topics and you put environment, you get 105 uh, reports, books, videos, et cetera. Um, you can learn much more than I can tell you or than I know uh, by going there. Um, I mentioned uh, PFAS, um, a Pentagon report from 2018 uh, details admits to widespread chemical poisoning of water supplies on military bases and in surrounding communities worldwide. Uh, the, the report identifies the presence of these chemicals in drinking water at levels known to cause cancer and birth defects. Uh, at least 401 bases are known to have contaminated water. Uh, these are chemicals that they use in putting out fires, but that they do not have to use in putting out fires. They could use others uh, that don't do this damage. Uh, and of course, many of the locations of these bases overseas are, are behave as if they are above the rule of law uh, and refuse to tell the so-called host countries uh, what's going on, what's in the water, much less uh, cease doing what they're doing. A, a, a colleague of ours uh, named Pat Elder has set up a, a website, militarypoisons.org, uh, where you can learn all you want to know and more about, about that issue. Um, this, I thought, was a fun fact to include in here, the fact that uh, heat waves are blowing up uh, piles of ammunition. Uh, just nice to know uh, this, you know, combination of environmental and military disaster. Um, I, I, I wrote a, if, if you're uh, fans of, of magical wizardy fiction, I, I wrote a story the other day uh, called Harry Potter and the Secret of Cop 26. Uh, you know, what, what, I, I'll, I'll give away, I'll blow the suspense. The secret is, of course, that militaries are left out of climate agreements. But if you want to read the story and share it around, it's at that link at the, at the bottom of this slide. Whoa, I lost the whole thing. There we go. Um, when we talk about the military and the climate, uh, generally the conversation focuses on the fact that the military admits that there is a problem with the climate, which is some sort of heroic deed in, in US culture, uh, and that the military is dealing with it and has plans to address it and so forth. Uh, but this is not a useful uh, way to be thinking. Uh, the military is draining our resources that are needed to address this problem, is itself driving climate collapse through the roof, uh, is, is discouraging the cooperation among countries and internationally that's needed, uh, is, is arming and training and uh, and funding with US dollars, brutal governments by the dozens around the world, many of which uh, it does in the interests of controlling oil and fossil fuels. Uh, it, it's waging wars, one-sided slaughters, horrible killings of, of people by the hundreds of thousands and millions, uh, in large part because of oil and, and the power and the wealth around controlling oil. Um, and the military's solutions uh, <laughs> never have anything to do or have very little to do with uh, preventing the ongoing destruction of the climate. Uh, often they're focused on 
militarizing borders, containing refugees, punishing the victims, uh, or, or they're focused on adapting uh, the military to so-called natural disasters uh, and encouraging other people to adapt to the problem rather than ceasing to, uh, to aggravate it. Obviously, we need to adapt, but that can't be all we do uh, or we will very quickly arrive at a situation where we cannot adapt, uh, no matter how much we put into it. Um, and, and of course, sending people armed and trained to kill and destroy to address problems like floods and forest fires is just not as good as sending people trained and skilled at addressing floods and forest fires. And it's often an excuse to get the military into various countries and regions from which it will never leave. Uh, so this is you know, not the solution we need. Um, and then of course, there is the other of the two big problems, the one that's never mentioned, the one that only exists because of militarism, which is also why it's never mentioned, uh, and that is nuclear apocalypse. Um, a little perspective on, on money. Um, Looking at uh, what President Biden proposed uh, earlier this year, which was to spend $1.2 billion on climate aid to poor countries. Um, uh, according to the US government, uh, $33 billion uh, in economic aid and $14 billion in so-called military aid, meaning weapons and training, uh, is what the US government gives out now. So the climate aid, aid is dwarfed by these other things. Uh, and of course, the factors considered in dishing out this aid uh, have absolutely nothing to do with the environmental behavior of other countries, with human rights, with women's rights, with anything uh, that they like to tell us about. Um, President Biden also proposed for the U.S. government to spend $14 billion on the climate, uh, a government that currently spends $20 billion on subsidies to fossil fuel companies, uh, not counting livestock uh, subsidies, uh, as well as $1,250 billion on militarism, on wars and war preparations. Uh, another comparison that we can throw in here or a shrinking <laughs> of this one uh, is again, those two biggest bills ever in the history of the world that we hear so much about uh, in the news, which combined would have been before they were scaled back today, $450 billion uh, a year as compared to that you know, $1,250 billion for militarism in the, in the block on the right there. Um, President Biden also said he wanted to reduce US emissions 50 to 52% by the year 2030. Uh, you know, which, which sounds, sounds so good, so much better than nothing. And of course this would be without touching the military, uh, but the fine print that the US media uh, doesn't report includes that what he meant was reducing 2005 levels by that amount uh, and the entirely missing print uh, that environmental activists know from past experience uh, to dig out and, and find includes uh, the practices of excluding from the calculation any emissions from imported goods or from international shipping or from aviation or from the burning of biomass, which is somehow green, uh, or of course from the military, plus the omission of predictable feedback loops, plus the building into these calculations of the benefits of imaginary future pro-climate technologies that don't exist today and may never. Uh, and, and then there are the things that even the environmental activist organizations tend to go silent on, including livestock and of course, including militarism, which is not just excluded from climate agreements, but usually from discussions about climate agreements entirely. Um, things we can do 
look at cop26.info, sign the petition, share it around, look at all the links at the top of the petition to events uh, happening in Scotland and around the world. Look at worldbeyondwar.org slash environment for a sort of a primer and a link to that resource system, resource database on war and the environment. Uh, push for, the, for a demilitarized Green New Deal uh, and work on building local alliances uh, in your area, in the Detroit area between peace and environmental groups because the environmental groups, you know, the Sierra Club and all the big environmental groups uh, at, at the top level at the national and international offices won't touch peace with a 10 foot pole, but the local chapters are, are more than happy to. Uh, and so we should build as many of those local alliances as we can. Um, and one thing that can be done locally, uh, it's fairly easy, very good chance of success, can be educational in the process, can build an organization in the process and give people that, you know, that victory dependence they have that, that you know, they're, they're willing to work on something bigger if they, if they achieve something smaller. Uh, it is divestment, uh, you know, here in Charlottesville, Virginia, and in lots of towns and cities, people have been able to get their governments to divest public money from both fossil fuel companies and weapons companies. Uh, and in some cases, we've done the two together with a resolution that educated people about the interlocking nature of these two issues. Uh, and accomplished the goal of getting the getting the money divested. Um, so it's a it's an educational and organizing process as well as accomplishing something useful uh, as well as you know contributing just that little bit to making destruction of the environment and waging of war into things that people have to be ashamed of. And with that, I will I will come back and see what you all are thinking. There are no questions in the chat. So if you have something you'd like to ask or something you'd like to say, um, you can raise your hand, we can see you. Yeah, Dark Waters mentioned in the chat is, is one of those movies I was thinking of. That's an excellent movie, except that it doesn't mention the biggest contributor to the problem uh, that is the topic of the movie. How can we compete with the big money lobby? Well, the, the obvious answers uh, include going local, which I already mentioned, uh, that the money is just a lot smaller uh, at the local level uh, and you can accomplish a great deal and inspire others to do the same at the local level. And if we have national and global organizations coordinating and providing resources and spreading word about your victory and the victory in some other locality, uh, it, it can snowball. Uh, another is to go global uh, and to work in countries that are not as militarized as the United States, but that contribute their bit to US militarism uh, and to advance reforms and demilitarization efforts in those other countries and through global institutions and, and global conferences like the one that's about to happen uh, in right. Scotland. And that's your next question. Are there countries or organizations pushing to include military emissions at Glasgow? Well, organizations, absolutely, no question. Again, there you can read a list of uh, getting close to 500 of them, maybe over 500 the next time I get a chance to update it at cop26.info. Uh, listing all the organizations, global, national, and local, uh, national in various nations, uh, in, in peace organizations and environmental organizations uh, that are supporting that petition. Uh, and we have a huge coalition 
uh, of organizations, uh, you know, focused on those in Scotland and UK and Ireland and Northwestern Europe, but, but from around the world, uh, working together on plans for advancing this agenda. Uh, in Scotland, and we certainly have members of Parliament and members of European Parliament and government officials from around the world uh, who are supportive. But that doesn't exactly equal governments. Uh, and uh, when we get a when we get some actual national governments uh, working on this with us, um, I will I will be glad to let you know. But I I do not know of that yet. How is the COP26 petition presented to the council? Well, we are working on uh, various means of delivering it to various uh, participants in the COP26 meeting. Um, and we're trying to get in-person meetings with some of the biggest of those big shots. And we'll see if we, if we can. Um, we also are promoting it in the media and are doing a press conference in downtown Glasgow on November 4th, two days before the, uh, the big march and rally there uh, with the biggest VIPs uh, we can gather uh, to present it to the media. Um, but it's not, you know, it, it's, it's not, on the agenda uh, of the of the COP26, uh, and unless we manage to change that, uh, it won't be. Uh, so our our accomplishment, if anything, and of course to some extent this is already happening, is going to simply be making people aware of the problem uh, and making governments uh, around the world aware of the problem and of the demand to change it. Um, but the chances, uh, the chances of the COP26 meeting, meeting our demands uh, look pretty slim at this point. Does the UN have any influence? Huh, I'm not, the questioner may want to elaborate on that if I don't answer it properly, but uh, of course this is a UN meeting we're talking about, so it, the UN has complete dominant control over every speck of it. Um, does the UN have any influence uh, on the course of human events in the world in general? Maybe a more interesting question that was intended, I don't know. Um, well, yes, obviously uh, it, it does, um, but it doesn't have the ex extent of influence or the type of influence that it should. Uh, and it really desperately needs to be reformed and democratized or replaced. Um, I mean, it's, it's just, as you know, never totally made sense uh, to make the entities that engage in war the members of an institution supposedly created to get rid of war and to pick five of the worst warmongers and weapons dealers and give and make them more equal than everybody else uh, and give them veto power and control over the agenda just wasn't going to work and isn't going to work. Uh, and, you know, the, the UN is, is just, you know, like the Nobel Peace Prize Committee, like, like NATO, like the European Union, like the government of Australia, like the International Criminal Court that's part of the UN and therefore under the thumb of the, of the big five permanent members of the Security Council. It, it, it's just part of the US and Western military apparatus. And it, and it has lots of great agencies and lots of great reports and, and lots of outstanding work, uh, but it doesn't prevent wars. Uh, and it doesn't seek to prevent wars, uh, and it doesn't strive to uh, treat as crimes anything that the big Western powers do. Um, and it, 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 it needs to be democratized, and it needs to recognize the strength of some of the things it does do. <laughs> you know, it, it needs to come to grips with the incredible 
power and success rate and flabbergasting achievements of, of unarmed civilian protectors who do a better job than armed so-called peacekeepers uh, of which, you know, <laughs> through which the UN constitutes the second biggest military uh, deployed around the world after the US. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it, it, it needs to be strengthened, it needs to be reformed, it needs to be changed, it needs to develop in certain ways and, and not in others. What would the US military look like if it were to become conscious of its role in climate destruction? It's hard for you know an entity made up of million people and countless buildings and machinery and airplanes to become conscious. Um, so, you know, if I, I, I don't think anyone at the at the highest levels in the U.S. military is in the least unaware uh, of what the US military does in terms of climate destruction, uh, they're, they're simply in favor of it, um, or you know, not in favor of the climate destruction, but uh, consider it unimportant in comparison with doing what the military does. Uh, and this is apparently a view that they have uh, persuaded or bullied uh, or rewarded um, most of the governments of the world uh, into sharing or acting as if they share so that uh, you have these climate agreements that simply leave out militarism. It's just more important to be killing people in the short term than to be addressing the need to avoid killing everybody in the long term. This, you know, this, is, this is how they see it. Um, I, I, I mean, the, the U.S. military is is far more aware of what's happening to the climate than any other agency in the US government. And they're churning out reports on it and progressives are just, uh, just fainting in admiration and ecstatic uh, praise for the military admitting that the problem exists and cataloging uh, the, the toll thus far and the future prospects and which uh, big bases are going to go underwater and so forth. I mean, this is how low we've come that just admitting that the problem exists and talking about it and proclaiming your intention to work on it, although you don't want to see what they mean by that, uh, is, is worthy of praise because it's, you know, compared to climate deniers. Uh, the fact that we're all nonviolent activism deniers never enters in to our love of fact-based, reality-based, science-supported public policy, right? We have to ignore the factual record on the success rate of nonviolence uh, if we're going to support institutionalized violence. Uh, and it's absolutely as destructive and absolutely as as in denial of the facts as climate denial, uh, it's just more politically acceptable. Has an effort been made to include a cleaning up of the military's actions in relationship to the environment in their budget during budget discussions each year? Yes, indeed, uh, not remotely sufficient, of course, uh, but they, the U.S. military is uh, compelled to and does at least partially clean up some of its disasters. Uh, but you can't, you know, you can't clean up nuclear waste. You can't clean up depleted uranium. You can't clean up uh, really entirely the destruction of using an island as a bombing range for decades. Uh, it just, it can't be done. Uh, you can do the best job you can, or you can do, you know, a halfway job with the budget you've got, but you can't undo that damage. You can't give countries back clean water and clean soil and, and eradicate disease pandemics that have been uh, stirred up by wars. Uh, you can, you can 
do a bit. Um, and uh, they do. Uh, and the more they do, the better. But, uh, but you know, we really should be having uh, professionals trained entirely in environmental cleanup and environmental disaster relief doing those things uh, better and, and more efficiently and, and less corruptly uh, and with less doubt as to real motivations uh, because endlessly for decades, the US military has used natural disasters and cleanup needs as a means of getting troops into a country, onto an island, and then they never leave. Uh, and has done, you know, phony operations that uh, that make things worse, uh, you know, and phony operations like the like the pretend polio vaccine that they were doing in Pakistan, where they were really rather stupidly testing people's blood to see if they were related to Osama bin Laden, uh, and. You know, then the result was a spread of polio and suspicion of vaccines, possibly including this, those suspicions back here in the United States as well, uh, and deadly attacks on on health workers trying to provide vaccines. So um, we ought to have the right agencies and the right departments uh, doing the work that's needed. Is there a way to lobby John Kerry, Recap Twenty Six? What would be the message to him? Include militaries and climate calculations for reductions of greenhouse gases? Uh, there is. Much more of it is, is needed. It hasn't succeeded uh, thus far. Uh, a, a wonderful group called Veterans for Peace that I'm on the advisory board of met with him in person with this demand uh, within the past year uh, and, and asked him why in the heck uh, militaries can't be included in climate agreements. Uh, and as far as I know, got nowhere. Um, and, you know, this is, this is a problem. The United States is, you know, is the, the big influence in the room and the big uh, contributor to this problem. Uh, you know, it's, it comes in, uh, comes in second place in some measures of environmental destruction to China, not per capita, of course, but, but overall, um, but on, on, the, on military destruction of the climate, uh, nobody comes close to the United States and, and the United States government is basically a war machine with a few side offices. This is what they do. Uh, and they, I mean, they build, they build, you know, outrageously expensive stealth nuclear bomber jet airplanes that don't fly, that crash, that, that have computers that don't work, and that the military doesn't even want because the Congress is owned by the weapons dealers. Uh, and, and so until the Congress is not owned by the weapons dealers, it's going to be hard to get John Kerry to agree to some sane demand unless we can really impose it on him with massive public pressure. I mean, if you, if you watched the, the, the hearings today in the Senate on confirming Rahm Emanuel for ambassador to Japan, uh, you know, yes, there was a brief discussion of this being the anniversary of him, of, of, a, of a police racist murder in Chicago that he covered up. Uh, and, you know, in my view, that's more than sufficient to bar him from being ambassador to anywhere. But the main problem was what the Congress members were all demanding of him and he was eagerly going along with which was stirring up hatred and war and with China and getting Japan to buy more weapons and threatening war on China. This, this is what they want. You know, this isn't something they're being dragged into reluctantly or that might accidentally happen someday. This is their goal, right? And so, uh, you know, John Kerry, uh, who, you know, ceased being a peace activist 40, 50 years ago, uh, and has been the opposite for decades now, 
you know, is not going to be on our team just because we suggest the idea as if he hadn't heard of it. Uh, it's going to take more than that. I read on it, this, uh, not me, the person who wrote this, Shirley. <laughs> I read on an environmental site that there are signs that some countries may pledge to reduce military greenhouse gas emissions at COP26 in November. Do you have a guess on what countries those would be? Um, I do not. Um, I wouldn't be at all shocked if, if they included the United States. Um, I just don't have uh, anything is vastly better than nothing, um, but voluntary vague pledges to do better uh, coming from individual militaries around the world or governments around the world is not going to be remotely enough. Um, and, you know, this is this is also the extent of legislation in the United States Congress. Congresswoman Barbara Lee has a bill. Uh, that would not require the United States to reduce um, military or any other emissions, uh, but would ask the military uh, to itself voluntarily uh, reduce emissions. Uh, I mean, this is the this is the radical. I don't know if there are even any co-sponsors on it yet. This is you know the radical edge of the demand. Um, and, you know, we, we have numerous countries uh, on earth that don't have militaries or have virtually no military. Uh, every single country on earth, uh, except the United States, is much closer to having no military than to having a military the size of the U.S. military and the budget of the U.S. military. Uh, and so it's going to be a lot easier for everybody else to do this, uh, especially if the United States doesn't crack down on them for it. Um, the United States controls a lot of other countries, punishes countries that don't sanction the countries it wants sanctioned, uh, punishes countries that support the International Criminal Court, et cetera. Um, and, and so if the United States goes along and doesn't object and other countries announce their, you know, sort of vague intentions to voluntarily someday reduce their military um, emissions, we should make the most of that. We should uh, proclaim it to be the sort of thing that's needed uh, and, and make as many people in the world as possible aware of it. Um, but we should demand actual laws universally applied and, and enforced and adhered to. Um, would our efforts to support a Department of Peace negotiate Department of Peace negotiations and settlement help add a counterpoint to the US's current use of imperialism and empire to settle differences? If so, how can we effectively advocate for this? It's one of these weird issues where I actually think that advocating for it does us more good than actually getting it would do. Um, I, I, you know, I talked about working to divest your local government from weapons. I think that does good in the educational process of making it happen. It also does significant good in, in, in winning and making it happen. Getting a Department of Peace, uh, in the US government, as it currently exists, uh, bought and owned and controlled by the weapons companies and the banks and the oil companies, uh, it, it as basically an institution of war, it's hard for me to grasp how it would operate significantly different from the US Institute of Peace that we already won decades ago with the almost identical campaign to the current one for the Department of Peace and which exists and which has a giant marble palace next to the Lincoln Memorial, which what I think uh, looks like a brazier, but they say is a dove uh, spreading over the roof and, and with Lockheed Martin carved in the marble and has yet to oppose a single war, right? And so to get a Department of Peace that's named Department of Peace, but operates in, in, in a way that I could plausibly expect it to within the current US government uh, doesn't interest me as much 
as the educational work of lobbying for a Department of Peace and talking to people about what it would do. This is why I, I once uh, was uh, held the, uh, you know, <laughs> sort of nonsense, not real position of Secretary of Peace in the Green Party shadow cabinet, uh, because we went around and did meetings and put out papers and here's what a Department of Peace would do in this circumstance. Uh, here's why there is a choice other than attacking ISIS or whatever it was. Uh, and, and, and so I, you know, I'm not against having a Department of Peace. I'm not against having somebody who says decent, humane things in cabinet meetings, uh, if it were that sort of official, even if they have no power and they're going to get overruled every time. Um, you know, it's all to the good. Um, but I think until we deal with the Department of War, um, you know, it's going to be hard for a Department of Peace to, to win out. I, I, my answer to this question in some countries um, is, is a little different because their governments, even just, you know, three miles north of you or whatever it is, uh, east of you. Uh, in Canada, I think the push for a Department of Peace uh, is, a, you know, is a little more meaningful there because they're a little less sold out uh, structurally and culturally. I mean, we can, we can say things in the Canadian media that we can't get printed here, you know? It's, it's not the same world exactly. But so, I, so I'm in favor of the worldwide movement for departments of peace uh, and celebrating the successes where they happen and continuing the, the struggle. Um, but I'm not sure I want it to succeed. <laughs> Just a couple of comments in the chat. You can read to yourself. It's the one about Emmanuel and uh, Sherry Wells is proud to say she's a fellow Green in the audience. And with that, I've got to leave, but Linda is now your host and hostess <laughs> and the meeting host, and she will um, she'll keep it going. Thank you, Melanie. You're muted, Linda. Oh, thank you, Melanie. <laughs> um, do we have any other questions? Um, if you have one, just go ahead and speak up because I'm uh, I'm not sure that I see it here in the chat. Anybody? I think there was something about that Jim Capizzo said. I'm not sure it was a question. About the ambassador to Japan. Uh, well, maybe everyone that I signed a petition, I think weeks ago against Ron Manuel being ambassador to Japan. Apparently Biden didn't get it. Um, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe everybody that uh, signed signed some similar petition could just raise their, their hand. I'd be curious. And if and if you haven't, you can go to rootsaction.org and sign one, uh, and and send an email with one click to uh, to your senators. Mm -hmm. Something to be able to do with one click. We like that. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have some questions? I think that's it. You've covered a lot of ground, David. <laughs> it's a lot for us to think about. Yeah. Um, and I, I, you know, the idea of bringing the climate crisis and the peace work together and showing how the military is uh, so involved in our worst enemy in terms of this and not recognize is a really powerful um, point to make that we will take under consideration and let the word out to everyone, including some of the actions that you've given us to do on our own. Mm -hmm. um, anybody else have anything to say in terms of what we should do moving forward? I think that's it. So I want to thank you so much for speaking to us. It's really been a privilege and. Um, we're excited to have somebody who's so involved in this process and who 
who's coming all the way from Virginia to us. <laughs> coming all the way. Uh, thank yeah. you. Thank you very well, much one, for the excellent question. questions. Oh, yeah, I just sorry. have one. That's okay. Go I just ahead. have one question. If, if we wanted to become an affiliate that you mentioned on your website, what would one have to do? Uh, send me an email or, or don't even, I'll, 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 I'll know that you want to do it and I'll, I'll send you an email and put you okay. in touch with uh, a colleague named Greta who uh, can work with you on that. I think it's uh, very simple and straightforward and, uh, and quick, but um, I'll, I'll let Greta Zaro, who's our organizing director, um, okay. talk with you about it. That would be terrific. Okay, that was a great presentation. Thank you, David. Oh, thank, thank you. you and thank you for the great questions. Yeah, this is quite a group. They have the questions, as you can tell. <laughs> Very <laughs> thoughtful <laughs> group. <laughs> well, let me let me know uh, by email or whatever if you have more questions or corrections or objections. Um, but I will keep in touch. Okay, okay thank, you, thank you so much. Thank you. Peace. Okay. <laughs> thank you, everyone. And um, I'm going to end the meeting. Does anybody have anything they want to add? No? Yes? Thank you all for being here. Bye-bye. Thank you, Linda. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.